let's see what's on my plate here and get it in the microwave. Alright, let's see, 10 seconds should probably be fine for this, so I'm gonna take a look. When it first uh, came out, you guys, the microwave was known as the Raider Range, as in radiation range. Aren't you glad we changed the name? Standing next to that thing, just thinking about radiation. And when it came to the market, it weighed in at 750 pounds, and it cost $2,000 on Black Friday, y'all. Now you fast forward to today, and it was probably the most used appliance in your house as you reheated your Thanksgiving leftovers. Welcome to Leftovers Weekend, you guys. Just so you know, let me clear something up. The campus pastor is named this weekend. It is not a reflection of how Patrick feels about us, or at least how he feels about me. In 1946, Percy Spencer, my man Spence, he was working on magnetrons. Now, if you're an 80s baby, come back, because you just heard the name Megatron, Magnetrons. And they go inside radars. There are components inside radars. And as he was working on this in technology, he went to go take a lunch break, and he reached into his pocket, and one of his favorite snacks, a caramel peanut cluster, had completely melted. Completely. And so you move up to today again, and it's in 90% of all the homes in America and it's sleek and sexy, and it can play your favorite playlist and tell you your blood pressure while you melt your hot pocket. But it all started. It all started from an accident. I mean, you can even say from the technology that he was trying to achieve that it actually all started from a mistake. I hope that gives you guys a little prequel of your favorite leftovers appliance, because that's what I love. I love prequels. My favorite sequels are prequels, because I love seeing people or characters in their glory story, right? Their arrival, their success. If there's someone that God has used, you see them in their mighty God-given plan, and you want to connect with their life. You want to be like that. At least I do. And so I like to go back and find out, well, how did they get there. We just finished a series called Rerouting, and we looked at the life of Moses. And so when I say Moses, you probably see the glory story. This is the image that most of you probably have. It's an old school image. It's him on a rock. His arms are flailing. He's got the staff in one hand. His robe and his Santa Claus beard are blowing in the glorious wind. He's parting the seas. And you see that, and you're like, yeah, God, I want some of that. You, you use, I, I, want, I want that. I want God to use my life just like that. But how, how did he get there? Let me go back to the kitchen for a moment. Um, although the microwave is a symbol of modern technology, it's also a symbol of how we as people, mankind, like to take power and control and destiny and direction right into our own hands. Think about it. Things that used to take lots of prep in 30 minutes to 45 minutes can now be done as fast and as hot as we want. And that seems like the way to go. That's the reason why it's in every home in America. The microwave, the microwave potential and process seems like the way to go unless... Unless you want to make what you did Thursday. See, on Thursday, you may have cracked open a can of corn and put that in a bowl and stuffed that into the microwave, but you ain't put that turkey nowhere near your microwave. Mm-mm. That turkey was massaged. Take it easy, girl, right there. Basted. Put into the oven. You're already at an hour. You're already at an hour. Put into the oven. We deep fried ours for the first time. Oh, my gosh. Maybe you fried it. Maybe you smoked it. Maybe you went old school Plymouth Rock Thanksgiving and rotisserated that bad boy over a flame, but you ain't put it in the microwave. Because there are just some things that you cannot microwave. 
And God's plan for your life is one of them. You cannot microwave God's plan. You cannot microwave God's plan. Let's take a look at Moses. Let's go to his prequel. Moses found out that you cannot microwave God's plan, that you cannot speed up his time. You cannot alter his recipe. You cannot change his temper. And you better not try and substitute his butter for our margarine. We're going to look in Exodus chapter 2. What you need to know about Moses is this is, We know the story about him running the Israelites across the parted Red Sea, but before that, he was running from the law. Oh, his prequel was that he was was a fugitive. He was a man on the run. And he grew up in Egypt where his people, he was a Hebrew, an Israelite, what we would say Jewish today. He grew up in Egypt as a Hebrew, but he lived in the palace. He was the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. He lived in the palace with the royalty because that is where Pharaoh's daughter, the king's daughter, found him and had him raised by his mom and then took him back and adopted him as a child and then raised him as an Egyptian. So he was a prince, a fresh prince. But if you know someone or if you are someone who has been adopted or has adopted, and you adopted someone of a different race, or your parents are a different race, from a young age, there was this inevitable conversation that had to eventually take place. You know what I'm talking about? Mom, dad, here, son, let me tell you. I mean, like, Moses had one of them. He had to have one of them, because he was clearly different than his Egyptian parents. And so he learned to find out that the people that were outside the window working hard and slaved were his own people. And maybe he got on Ancestry.com and started to look around and wanted to connect, but he was curious and he he started to want to be close even to his people. Let me show you. This is what happens in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. One day after Moses had grown up, so he knows, he knows the difference between he and his parents and his people. He went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. Look at the look at the choice of words. Their hard labor. He was he was empathizing. He was connecting. He felt something for them. For their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own, one of his own people, looking this way and that and seeing that seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day, he went out and he saw two of his Hebrews fighting, and he asked the one that was in the wrong, whoa, 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 hey, why are you hitting him? Why are you guys fighting? And the man said, oh, well, who, who died and made you the ruler and the judge over us? What you going to do, Moses? You going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian? And like, the camera, like, zooms in like it did in Jaws on, on, on the chief, and, like, his eyes get real big, and he strings, and, like, somebody saw that? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. And when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but he fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. All right, let's carve this turkey up a little bit. Um, I have a confession that I have to make on behalf of Christianity. We are just like every other part, the church is just like every other part of popular culture, meaning that we have cliches, unfortunately. And although the Bible was powerful and the things that we say in it are so very true, it's our fault that it becomes cliche. And one of those, because it's so powerful, one of those unfortunate cliches is, hey, God has a plan, say it with me, for your life. Sounds like a game show, your life, right? Like we made it a cliche. And even though like it's so powerful, Jeremiah 29, 29 11, it lays it right out. God says, I know the plans I have for you plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Ask any tattoo artist if that ain't in the top five things he's ever tatted on somebody. I'm telling you, we made it cliche. And it also becomes that way and all the more painful whenever we don't know or don't even have a sense about what that plan is. When we don't know what that plan is. I want to show you something today, so I hope you're ready for this. 
One of the ways, just one, just one, it's not the only way and it's not the ultimate way, but one of the ways that God will reveal to you his plan is through pain. Pain like something that doesn't sit right in your gut. Maybe pain inflicted on you or pain that you've inflicted upon others. Maybe just the tensions around the world. I can't stand when I see this or I wish this wouldn't happen or this keeps me up at night. Things that just aren't right and there's a pain connect. You feel it. That's one of the ways that God will reveal his plan. It's what he did with Moses. Take a look. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own. Let me help you understand Moses' pain. We all, in 2020, we all owned this statement. And so I want you to say it with me. One of his own people. When COVID hit and it was this thing that we saw on the news, it was just whatever. But then when somebody we knew got it, no, now it came for one of my own. When our pastor got it, oh, it got real. We were like, oh, it came for, one. we all got tested. We were like, we came for one of our own. When civil rights movement 2020 flared to the surface this year, you guys, it didn't matter what your race is, we all felt one of our own. And it's okay, whatever your race is, we all felt it. We felt one of our own. When it was time for the election, and it was red versus blue and left versus right, we felt it. We felt the pain of one of our own. This pain God was using to awaken Moses' purpose. He was, he was arousing something in him. And so when he got mad and his heart started pounding and he couldn't stand what he was seeing, he actually was totally in line with God the whole way through until, until he grabbed a hold of that plan, threw it in the microwave, and went from zero to fatality on somebody. He was actually in the same right with God until the moment he grabbed the wheel out of God's hands and yanked it away. God will use your pain. God will use your passion. He will use your desires. He will use your physical ability, your mental ability. He will use your circumstances, good or bad, and he will use something that weighs heavy on your heart. This was heavy on Moses' heart, and it was heavy on God's heart. So how, how did it become a roadblock? When we microwave God's plan, that's what happens. We, we run into roadblocks on the course of life that God has for us, unforeseen ones, ones that we didn't know could come up, ones that we didn't know could happen to us, ones that we didn't know would cost us this much, keep us this long, and hurt this bad. And then Moses microwaved it here in this moment. This is where it happens. Give me a second. Do I have a scripture there, guys? Yeah, let me go to Exodus 2.12. I'm sorry if I put them out of order. Go to Exodus 2.12 for me. Here you go. This is where he does it. Looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian. Here's where he microwaved it, you guys. Looking this way and that. He checked his back. He checked where his boss was at. He checked where his parents was. He checked where his friends may be. He checked the statuses on Facebook. He checked this way and that. He looked everywhere but up. He looked everywhere but up to God about what to do with this burning pain inside of his heart and about what to do about it. We do that. We're hungry to find out what our purpose is in life and what God has for us. And so we look, you're supposed to. So we look, we look to Wikipedia. And we look to Google. We check the reviews on Yelp. We go to a medium. We'll ask a plastic eight ball. We'll look everywhere. But to God. And when we don't, When we don't look to God, we start to make decisions, costly ones, 
Ones that happen in an instant like Moses and have lasting consequences. Moses had to run and was gone for years. And sometimes it's not a hard right or a hard left that we go away from God's plan for us. Sometimes it's just a, something slight. It's a slight right. You know how Siri tells you, take slight right, right. It's a slight right. And then another slight right. And then another slight right. Just, just a little no back here when there should have been a yes to God or a, or a yes right here where there should have been a hard no. And before we know it, we're off somewhere else. And just like Moses tried to, we try to bury it in the sand. When the consequences of our actions and our decisions start to, the wind blows and starts to surface through the sand, we try to bury it. We try to bury it with our drink of choice, with our drug of choice. We try to bury it with manipulation. We try to bury it with lies. We try to bury it in work and money. We try to bury it in whatever we can get our hands on. And when the burying doesn't work, look at verse 15. When the burying doesn't work because the consequences always find us. When Pharaoh heard about this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses ran. What we can't bury, we run from. New number, who this? Second job this year. New social media profile. New zip code. What we can't bury, we run from. God's plan can have pain. Whether we cause it or it's just from the things in life, God's plan can have pain. But we're asking for more anytime we try to microwave that plan. I just, I can't help when I think about Moses and what he did. I, I, see, this, I see this scene from Avengers Endgame where the ancient one and Bruce Banner, where they were talking about time, and she drew this timeline. And she said, well, if something happens here in time, it, it doesn't change everything back here. It just creates this alternate time down here. That's where Moses was. God had this plan here for him, and he did something that took him all the way down here, off the map, off God's purpose, living somewhere he had no idea he was at, running from his past, down in some alternate life, some plan B life. I got to settle now for this plan B, not God's best because of what I did, because of how many turns, because I got the wheel with my motives and my reasoning and my agenda and my selfishness. I got the wheel. So here I am. Man, why don't we just ask God? Why didn't Moses ask God? Why didn't he just ask God? But to his defense, though, this all happens in chapter 2. It's actually not until chapter 3, the next chapter over, that we see Moses actually meet God. God introduces himself to him. So if he meets him in chapter 3, maybe that means that he didn't even know God yet in this moment. So if he didn't know God, he wouldn't know to ask God for direction. Do you? Do you know God? Because if you don't know God, I'm not asking you if you've been to church or if you've Got scripture tatted on you, or if you've heard about gods or different, I know I'm asking, do you, do you know God? Because if you don't, you probably won't understand why I would say that God's plan can have pain. And when I say that, it probably makes you picture God as like the ant bully. He's just this mean kid with a magnifying glass, just shooting down sunbeams of pain all over us. That's not him. See, pain is a side effect of the broken human nature called sin. Sin, pun intended, sin is what drives us to take the wheel from God 
and think that we have a better route. And it leads us into these roadblocks. It leads us into these roadblocks that take us away from God's best. It has from all of time. It wrecks us. It destroys us. It crash courses. It gives us a flat tire with no help on the side of the road. It leads us to death. And it leads us to death apart from God. But, although God's plan can have pain, pain can have power. Pain can have power. See, the same way that Moses looked out and saw one of his own and felt this ownership and this injustice and this uprising and that something had to be done, God has seen that from the moment that we left him as humanity. God saw this sin stuff beating us up, beating us with diseases, beating us with broken families, beating us with destruction, beating us with the very things we thought were good for us that poisoned us from the inside. He saw it beating us and beating us. And so like Moses, he rose up and he did something. Next month, we celebrate Christmas. And that's what Jesus, that's what God did. He sent Christmas. He sent Jesus to this planet. And when Jesus got here, he got to the moment where when he saw his own, when he saw us, you and me, when he saw us being beaten by sin, he stepped in and he did something like Moses. But unlike Moses, he didn't strike anybody. He pushed us out of the way and he took the beating on himself. He took the physical beating. He took the figurative beating. He took the beating of an ugly cross. Here's where the pain has power. But because of that pain that Jesus took, there's power now to forgive us of all that sin. The sin that took us off course. The sin that pulls us away from God. And to know God is to believe in this next part I'm about to tell you. Jesus didn't stay buried when he died and they buried him. God brought him back to life. He brought him back to life. And so pain can have power, the power for you right now, that if you don't know God as you're watching this, as you're here in this room, you can know him right now. And all you need to do is believe what I just told you. I recited it. God wrote it. But it's true. For you, Jesus took the penalty of sin. And if you want that relationship with God today, if you want to know God all you need to do is believe it. Yes, God, I want that. And if you do, and if you do, will you make our Thanksgiving weekend and let us know? Will you text us, Jesus, to this number, 41411, and let us know you made a decision to trust Jesus today, to know God today. Jesus is the full meal. But Jesus is known because the Jesus I know shows up to parties. They run out of water. He turns it into wine. Jesus I know shows up not only with the turkey, but with dessert. Do y'all know the dessert? The dessert about Jesus coming back to life. Do y'all know that again? The meal is that we get to be forgiven of sins. We get to know the God who loves us and who made us and who rescued us. That's a meal. That's all the meal we need. But I like dessert. Why do you think that there's a picture? You guys online, there's a picture behind me of pumpkin pie. Two slices of pumpkin pie looking like they're having a conversation. I'm gorgeous. How about you? I am too. Like, that's what's behind me. I love dessert. And you need to have the dessert with this meal right now. Here's the dessert about Jesus coming back to life. Moses had a destination, but now here he is, down here living in some alternate world, some alternate life when he should be up here. He should be on course for God's plan, just like we should be on course for God's plan with us. But here we are, for whatever reason, little turns or a hard right turn or a mistake or taking the wheel, here we are. It's in this moment. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 10. It's in this moment. It's in this place, away, away from God's plan, that God shows up and meets Moses. He's a right where you're at kind of God. He's a right where you are kind of God. He's a right who you are right now in this moment kind of God. And that's how he shows up to Moses. He shows up to Moses and he tells him the entire story, the backstory, the future. He tells him, listen, the reason why you had this pain in your heart is because I want you to do something about it. You're the one that I want to do something about it. You're going to fix this problem. 
My plan is in your pain. You're going to fix this problem. And he says, so now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. You can't microwave God's plan. God's plan can have pain. Pain can have power, and that power can bring you back. The same power that brought Jesus out of the grave is the power that can bring you back to God's plan for your life. If God can reach into a grave and pull out a body that was dead and bring it back to life, you are not off the map yet. You are not too far gone. Nowhere near it. And in your heart, you can meet God right where you are. We can't go back and change the things that we did. Here's our timeline. And we messed up right here and we got skewed down here somewhere. We can't go back and we can't take back the mistake. We sure can't take back the consequences. But we can go back to that point and we can say, this time, God, this time, we're going to do it your way. If Percy Spencer would have just left that gooey mess in his pocket, that's all it would have been was a mess. If you stay in your pain, if you stay in the mistakes that you made, that's all it will ever be is a mess. But if you go back and find out what happened and do it different this time, the results change the world. They change your world. You can go back to the point of the decision, you can go back to the beginning of the relationship, you can go back to where you quit, you can go back to where you ran, you can go back to the beginning of the, the, of the affair, right where it happened in your DM when you should have been running away, but you said yes, you can go back to that moment, you can't erase what happened, but you can give, these, you can give this wheel back to God, and if you give it back to God, he'll scoot you over in the passenger side, he'll hop in, he'll put, Jesus take the wheel on the radio, and he'll take over. And you will be back right where he's always intended you to be. That's a beautiful dessert, y'all. The fact that God won't desert us is a beautiful dessert. Now, I like pumpkin pie. And to me, that's a really nice slice of pumpkin pie that God would let us come back and still have a plan waiting for us. And I, I like pumpkin pie, but I got to be honest, I don't like it by itself. Not at all. See, it's just a slice of pie like that, but it's a dessert, Kayla. It's a dessert when you take a giant glob of Cool Whip and drop it right on top. Do y'all want some Cool Whip on this pie? Because there's more. Not only does God have the power to bring us back to his plan, he's got Cool Whip for this slice of pie. Watch. The whole reason that God gave Moses this plan to get his people out of slavery wasn't just to have some great exodus. He had a destination for them to get to. And so leaving Egypt and going to this new homeland was going to take somebody to guide them and lead them and teach them and feed them and keep them on course when they got off. It sounds a lot like being a shepherd. When Moses messed up and got his life derailed off course and was away from God for years, do you know what he was doing when God showed up and met him? He was a shepherd. Not only, not only will God bring us back to his plan, he says, when you come back, all the things you were doing while you were gone, bring them with you, and I'm going to upgrade them. I'm going to take you from sheep to people. But God, but God, I did that when I left you. I did it all over here when I was wrong and left. I know. Bring it with you, and I'm going to turn it in to something amazing. I'm not going to waste what you did. I don't know about y'all, but like when I had Thanksgiving, and as a kid, my parents and my uncles and aunts would be looking at my shoulder. Every time I took something, they go, you better eat that because you don't waste a thing on Thanksgiving. God doesn't waste even our mistakes. He doesn't waste our roadblocks. He takes the things that should have been a slap in his face and says, I'll just turn 
turn into a slap of Cool Whip on top of pumpkin pie, and we're going to live this thing out together this time. You're not too far gone. You're not off the map. Before we go into worship, I'm going to take a moment and I want to pray. Can I pray? God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this weekend. Thank you for your grace. That is what the cool whip is, God. It is grace. We don't deserve to even be back in your plan, but not only do we get to be in your plan, you're going to take what we did while we were gone and turn it into something amazing. God, I I pray tonight for somebody who's off course. I pray for their heart to be awakened, and I pray for them to come back. God, I pray for the one who said yes to Jesus tonight, to believing in you for the first time. God, I ask you to burn in their heart this new relationship with the God who loves them and who would save them and bring them back to your plan. God, it takes courage to pull over to the side of the road, to reroute and to come back to your plan. But God, I pray it tonight over all of us, no matter where we are. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us for this message. Even though the sermon is over, your experience has just begun. Lifehouse is a community that we want you to be a part of. So here's a couple things we want you to do. First, subscribe to this channel. There are many other messages and content that we think is gonna be very valuable to you. Next, reach out to us. You can text LH Next Steps to 41411 and there's a community waiting just for you.